Welcome to our uh, annual clean water uh, workshop. And uh, we are videotaping this so that uh, it'll be available online as well. But uh, we have had since 2015 every year, um, since the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act was created, um, the Environmental Facilities Corporation um, has been uh, uh, generous enough to come down and uh, provide hands-on questions and answers about the program. And our real goal is to encourage Westchester municipalities and, and Hudson Valley municipalities to take advantage of a program that so far has provided $1.8 billion in grants to uh, municipalities for clean water projects uh, uh, amounting to, I think, over 100,000 new jobs created through that in Westchester County. Um, Westchester County municipalities have received over $55 million in grants over the years. So it has been a, a great program, something that was, was uh, needed, and uh, you're here to do the right thing, which is let's get that money to your municipalities. Um, what I'm going to do before we go to the presentations is I'm going to invite some of our sponsors to come and talk about their role in this and what they do. And I'm going to start um, um, with Kevin. Kevin um, Perano, who is the uh, executive director, is that executive, director, executive yeah. director of the J Heritage Center, which is our host here. And I'm, I'm going to preface it by saying New York State actually owns 90% of the land on this historic site. And Westchester County owns 10%. And the J Center owns um, a chunk also, uh, especially the carriage house and around the mansion. But this is uh, not only an important historic site, this is a, a living not-for-profit that provides great programming, great educational opportunities. And for the environmental community, they host tremendous environmental uh, programs throughout the year, including ours. And maybe Kevin's going to talk a about their beautiful gardens project and, and, and everything else. So Kevin, thank you so much. And we also have in the back Suzanne Clary, who's the president of the J Heritage Center. So let's thank them for hosting us at this beautiful location. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, Steve mentioned I'm Kevin Perino. I'm the executive director here. Suzanne uh, Clary, who's president of our board, um, is in the back. And um, we are, um, uh, you know, we're a, a historic site. This site is the, the boyhood home um, of the founding father, John Jay. For those of you who don't know, it's a, haven't been before, it's a 23-acre um, park. Um, but we're also an education center. We do programs in history, preservation, social justice, um, and environmental stewardship, um, importantly. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that 30 years ago, um, when a group of neighbors uh, got together to save this place um, from development, a developer wanted to build uh, suburban housing here, um, the, the historical factor was one part of it. This is part of the Boston Post Road Historic District, the historic imp importance, but um, the environmental impact on the sound um, was also uh, a critically important factor in saving this estate. And so caring about clean water is in our DNA here, and, um, and we continue to do a lot of programs like this one and other environmental programs, um, and that's something that's really important to us. Um, Another thing that's really important to us and the only way um, that this place could have been saved um, is our partnerships. Um, we, we rely on our partnerships um, and it's an important part of what we do. And so the partnerships with local organizations like Save the Sound and others who are here today, the partnership with um, local legislators um, like Steve and others um, have just been critically important. I mean, we couldn't have, we couldn't have saved uh, this place. Um, without those um, things. Um, Steve mentioned the gardens. I just want to quickly mention a couple of kind of environmental um, uh, programs of interest that we have coming up um, this fall um, that you might be interested. One of the things Steve mentioned um, is these beautiful um, uh, historic Jay Gardens. Um, they just, our grand opening was, was just this June. So if you've been here before and you haven't been to the gardens, um, please come. They're brand new and um, we know a little something about um, the benefits of New York State grants because ours was funded in part with a half million dollar grant um, from New York State. And so um, that's, you know, the only way this could have happened. And they're really, 
a, a, a fabulous resource here. They're gorgeous, they're huge, they're, they're three garden rooms. And one of the things we decided to do this year is to keep them open all day Sunday from 10 to five Sunday uh, and from 10 to two on Thursdays. And so you can just, you can come by and drop in and there's all kinds of things. They're, they're gorgeous and there's pollinator panels with, um, you know, with native plants that are planted in the meadow. Um, so um, please come by um, and visit those. Um, we also do um, program, we do programs with authors, book talks, that sort of thing. And we have another program, you might be interested, it's on Friday, October 7th, um, with the author Andrea Wolf. She wrote a book called Founding Gardeners, and she wrote her most recent book, I think, was called The Invention of Nature. Um, she's going to be here on a Friday night um, at 6. That's on our website. We have a book, uh, a red book out front. Um, that you can sign your name and your email address if you'd like to be added um, to our website. And one last thing that I should mention this fall that we have coming up on October 29th, which is a Saturday, um, we're doing a sustainability symposium and the speakers include Doug Tallamy, who um, if you've never heard him speak um, is a treat um, to hear him. He talks about invasive species. He's going to be talking about um, his book. Um, he's an ed Entom etymologi entomologist, how do you say that word? Um, he, he studies bugs. Um, and um, he's going to be talking about his book, The Nature of Oaks. Um, we also have Larry Weiner, um, who kind of led the reclamation of our meadow um, several years ago. And we're going to do some other speakers and workshops. So that's going to be a great event, too. So thanks very much, um, Steve, for letting us host once again. And um, we're looking forward to the program. Next, we're going to have up one of our sponsors every year, um, George Trapeau from the uh, Construction Industry Council of Westchester and Hudson Valley. And George, come on up. But uh, they have been a great partner in advocating, the, the construction industry, advocating for these programs and other important in, environmental investments that help mun municipalities. Come around this way and, and uh, uh, tell us a little about CIC's good work. Well, first, I'd like to thank Steve for the uh, fabulous weather that we have today. Uh, you managed to get that heat wave broken, and I truly appreciate it. These are very subjective things. I think it's still too hot. So. Right. <laughs> uh, so I was chatting with our friends, uh, Save the Sound in the back. Uh, I go back to 1982 with Long Island Sound. Actually, I grew up in Pelham, so uh, I, my beach was uh, Glen Island Casino. and. Um, the uh, 1982, I started a windsurfing school just uh, on the Playland property to the north. And for three years, uh, we held regattas and we taught windsurfing. And we lived in the Long Island Sound all summer long. And I can tell you, it's a different Long Island Sound today. Much cleaner, much more pristine than it was back in 1982, when we would fall in the water and encounter uh, civilization. Um, we, when we go around and we talk to uh, uh, community groups and we say, you know, what's the difference between a, a civilized society and an uncivilized society? And it really just boils down to one factor, and that is how we treat our waste. Uncivilized societies did not address their waste, and they were uh, migrant and vagabond, and they, uh, they moved on. Uh, civilized societies treated their ways. In 1982, I became committed because of uh, uh, my involvement in local politics and uh, Susie Oppenheimer, which is a predecessor of yours, right, uh, got me involved. And then in 1991, I wound up with the uh, Construction Industry Council, and there was a massive protest rally, uh, both by environmentalists and conservationists, and the construction industry, labor unions and contractors, they were at war because one wanted to shut down development and the other one wanted to continue with development. And we came to a, a peace and a truce and then an alliance, and now we are, there is a powerful bond that we are in fact tied together. It is an hourglass. You can't have a clean environment without the projects that control pollution. And so we worked together. We went to Washington after 1991. Steve came down with us. We uh, lobbied for the National Estuaries Bill, billions of dollars brought to uh, communities, and especially Long Island Sound, which we always characterized as uh, because of its uh, five, six states that um, uh, are exposed to it. Um, it is, we are at the shallow end of a swimming pool, and we don't have a skimmer box here. 
we have to build our own skimmer box. And so we do that through pollution control. We capture, we treat, we release. And it's been just a joy to work with Steve and go to Albany and get this bill passed and get all the money for clean water and infrastructure renewal. Uh, I will say that the Hudson Valley in Region 3 uh, of uh, DEC uh, is one of the most aggressive in the state for educating the local municipalities about the opportunities. Um, I live in Armonk, New York now. Anybody ever been to Armonk? It's, uh, do I hear Armonk out there? It's an Iroquois word. It means home of pricey Italian restaurants. <laughs> So Armonk uh, is part of the uh, town of Northcastle, and we applied for a grant, and uh, we got some UV money. Uh, we upgraded our water filtration treatment programs, thanks to the, the program that we're going to hear about today. Uh, I can't encourage you enough to apply. Uh, we had Steve, uh, 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 Paul Feiner here a few years ago, didn't know about the program, learned about it, He's the Dean of Supervisors for uh, Westchester County and Greenberg. And right off the bat, they got three grants. So, I mean, it's wonderful to see these projects go forward. We document these uh, projects throughout the Hudson Valley in a report every year, and we send these out to the municipalities. I've given you a little bit about what CIC does. Uh, and I thank you all, and uh, enjoy the program. Thank you, George. I should add that uh, CIC and George and uh, Ross Pepe, who used to be the head of CIC, and John Cooney, who's now the head, they have been big advocates in terms of creating these programs and growing these programs. So uh, we, we thank them. Um, next, I'd like to have uh, Peter Linderoff of Save the Sound come on up and, and say a little about Save the Sound and, and uh, uh, another one of our important sponsors and partners. All right. Well, I know Armonk well. I don't know if you're talking about Amore when you were talking about the Italian restaurant, but I have many dinners there. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman Otis. Thank you, Steve, for the introduction. Um, really happy to be here, happy to sponsor this event. Um, but a bigger thank you to you and everyone that's really fought for these funds um, since 2015 and before. Critical funds for clean drinking water, clean waters in our rivers, lakes, estuaries like Long Island Sound, which of course we focus a lot on, the Atlantic Ocean, incredibly critical. So thank you very much. And thank everyone in this room that's worked on that. Um, so as Steve said, my name is Peter Linderoth. I'm the Director of Water Quality at Save the Sound. I work in our Larchmont office right down the road here in Westchester. Um, we have another office in Connecticut. As our name says, we're Save the Sound. So you probably have a pretty good idea of what we do. Um, maybe to break it down a little bit more, we're here to kind of protect, restore the sound and all the lands that flow into it. Um, and that's a pretty big undertaking. And there's about 35 of us on staff. And I'll tell you, I love working at Save the Sound. My colleagues are outstanding. We have a lot of fun with what we do. Many of us have really deep connections to the sound. Great organization. Um, so protecting and restoring Long Island Sound, though, it's, uh, it could be challenging at times. We see the good, we see the bad, we see the ugly, frankly, in terms of water quality. I'm going to focus mostly on water quality. Um, and we are definitely solutions-based. So we have environmental scientists like myself, my team. Um, we have engineers. Um, we have advocates, lobbyists, attorneys. You know, we do have attorneys. We'll go that route now and then as well. Um, and communication specialists like David back there snapping pictures of me. And thank God for a communication specialist, because if you give me the opportunity to write on science topics, I write on them. And they break that stuff down, and it's great. Um, so, as I was saying, though, we're very solutions oriented. We're not doom and gloom. I've never been a doom and gloom person myself. I like to stay optimistic on challenges, work towards them. And these clean water infrastructure grant funds are a huge solution to, to pollution and problems that we have in our watershed and in the sound. Um, it's really, really, really key that they get out and get to where they need to be. And, and on that, I'd like to thank everyone that's here. Thank you for managing our resources. You know, you all have these critical roles that you fill. And just thank you all very much for coming out today and for, for doing the work you do to protect water, both for drinking and, and uh, the sound proper, and lakes and other, and other areas, of course. So as I was, uh, I was coming out here, I was thinking uh, quickly, and as uh, George mentioned, you know, in the 80s, the sound essentially flatlined, and I'm not going to talk about that now. That gets a little doom and gloomy, but here we are decades later, and the sound is significantly, and I don't use that word lightly, significantly improving. 
because of wastewater infrastructure improvements, nitrogen reductions specifically, we're seeing very significant improvements in the open sound. But bays and harbors are still struggling. They have localized pollution sources in many cases. I was out the other day um, sailing, and again, I want to preface that by director of water quality at a nonprofit, so don't think I was on some big sleek boat. I was out on the uh, Ideal 18 fleet having fun with the sailing group at my public yacht club, public yacht club. Um, but we were out, you know, and I won't talk too much about sailing, but we're on our, you know, lured mark and sitting there and jabbering at the people next to us in the boats. And I was looking out, that means we weren't moving very fast, by the way, uh, looking out and there were thousands of bunker. And you guys know what I mean when I say bunker? Atlantic Menhaden, they're, they're a fish in the sound, incredibly important to the ecosystem in Long Island Sound. Um, animals eat them, they're filter feeders, really critical, critical fish in the sound. And there were thousands of them out there. And it was fun to watch, you know, I, I couldn't think of a better place at that moment I'd rather be, except maybe moving a little faster on that boat. But if we rewind from there, about a week and a half earlier, different Long Island Sound abatement, different bay on the sound, different purpose. I was out with one of my field teams doing water quality sampling. Um, we noted uh, dissolved oxygen levels, and this is right down the coast, not too far from here. Plummeting, basically zero. Forget hypoxia, there was no oxygen in the water. And as we're going up into the inner portions of this bay, we're seeing these things floating in the water, and you could take a guess at what they were. Not a thousands and thousands of live bunker doing their job, but thousands of dead and dying bunker. And it was terrible, it was terrible to witness. Um, but again, I thought about, you know, well, hey, save the sound, I'm in the right place at least. We're advocating for improvements in this bay, as other people are too. And I thought about these funds, that's where I'm going with this, besides liking to tell stories, I suppose. I thought about these funds, upstream communities um, that contribute pollution to that bay, I mean, it is what it is, have tapped into these funds in the past and continue to for sanitary sewer infrastructure upgrades and for stormwater uh, upgrades and reductions of stormwater. And we should be seeing some benefits to that bay. Hopefully we'll see more life get breathed into it and we won't be seeing thousands of dead bunker there. And this is part of the reason. These funds are part of that solution for that bay. So again, thank you for all you do, Steve. Thank you for all you do in the audience. Happy to be here. Hopefully we're here next year. Love the Jay Center. It's a lot of fun here and uh, enjoy the training. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, they're not here to speak, but I, I want to recognize our two other sponsors, uh, Federated Conservationists of Westchester County and um, Westchester Municipal Officials Association, and very important in um, supporting these uh, programs and, uh, and making things happen and doing, doing outreach. So um, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to do a little run through on what's in the Environmental Bond Act in November. Um, and I have a, a special affinity to one of the things in there because as we created these clean water programs, um, I actually have a proposal in the Bond Act to create a new program for stormwater, which is another piece of the action that municipalities spend a lot of money on and can use some state grants um, uh, to, uh, to help fund projects. So um, on uh, November 8th, uh, we have a bond issue of uh, $4.2 billion. We do, a, in New York State, um, an environmental bond issue sort of like every 20 years, and uh, this, is, this is our, our bite at the apple now. And uh, uh, the last one I think we did was in 96. Before that, I think 86. Um, but uh, so what's in it? The components are $1.1 billion for restoration uh, projects and um, flood risk reduction. And so key in that, and there, is, there was a handout out front that has these specifics, but uh, something that we had actually a program here a few months ago on shoreline restoration uh, using uh, natural kinds of uh, thinking in terms of how to uh, do shoreline projects. And uh, this is the shoreline that you're looking at right here is over behind Playland um, before the Edith Reed Sanctuary. And um, uh, there's money for inland flooding, uh, local waterfront revitalization, and um, a new program, also something that um, Senator Shelley Mayer and I have been big advocates for, is $250 million for buyouts of flood properties that are not that tenable. I see Chris Bradbury here in a village of Rye Brook, and they have some projects that we're trying to get some federal funds to do that now. 
but there's not a real state program to do that. We are hopefully with this bond act creating a, 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 a state funding stream where you have a flood prone property that really is just untenable and the, the people want out and, and we want to put some money on the table to make those transactions happen. We are doing it um, in at least Rye Brook with um, a federal agency, uh, the uh, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is out of the uh, Department of Agriculture, and doing a, uh, hopefully some buyouts in Rye Brook along Blind Brook. We're gonna have a state program. Um, also, um, uh, and so let me, go, let me go through all the categories here. 650 million for um, open space land conservation and recreation projects, 1.5 billion for climate change and mitigation projects, 650 million for water quality improvements, and then there's 300 million unallocated, which uh, when we see what areas need more money, there's some flexibility money there to make that happen, which is very helpful. And again, here's the, the rundown I already gave you for the first 1.1 billion. Um, also some habitat restoration. Um, um, again, other kinds of, of flood infrastructure projects and culverts and, and all sorts of sexy things like that. Only sexy to the municipal people and engineers that are in this audience. The, the rest of the world would not get so excited. 650 million for open space conservation recreation projects. Uh, that's a beautiful vista of the Adirondacks and uh, um, um, some adorable dogs uh, from a different era of uh, uh, ours. Uh, that is uh, Dudley, a Labrador Retriever, and Lucky, a, uh, uh, a, a uh, uh, rat terrier, as they say, goes underground. Open space, uh, farmland protection, fish hatcheries. 1.5 billion for climate change projects. Um, we don't have school district people here, but 500 million is for um, uh, energy uh, uh, electric school buses, green buildings, renewable heating and cooling, um, uh, disadvantaged communities, climate adaptation. Um, I expect that some of these projects are going to be projects that municipalities are going to be able to take a, a, a piece of for the kinds of projects that you do. Um, 650 million for water quality improvement projects, um, new funding for the programs we're discussing today, the WIA and IMG programs, and then a new, um, as I said, uh, new state municipal um, program for stormwater. And um, that, what I am so excited about is to get that on the table. Been pushing for that for a number of years. You also have um, sewer line replacement, lead, lead, uh, service line replacement, um, algae, all that sort of uh, good stuff. Um, again, that's on the ballot on November 8th. Now, I am going to move to the next presentation, if I can find it, and God only knows. Um, who, is Kevin still in the house? Maybe not. Let's see. Okay, here we go. No. Maybe. Okay, here we go. So I am going to start. Um, our folks in the Environmental Facilities Corporation who are going to be here shortly, but believe it or not, they got a flat tire on the way down from Albany today. So my next workshop is going to be on um, tire resilience for <laughs> governmental vehicles. We don't know whether this is a, a failing in the pothole system on the Taconic State Parkway or whether OGS did not maintain the tires on these vehicles uh, to appropriate tread length. But they will be here. And really, the most important thing that they can provide is to answer your specific questions that you may have about applications that you uh, are contemplating or have pending. And, and so uh, they will be here in a little bit. So I am going to do their presentation, and um, which I have not planned on doing. So we'll see how we go. Um, OK, EFC overview. Uh, grant program introduction, we'll just move right on here, and what we'll do, EFC, um, and I think you already know this, EFC is really the state agency that administers 
um, for uh, many decades the state revolving loan fund and now with the creation of these grant programs, a series of grant programs that are often matched with the revolving loan fund. New York State EFC and with the backing of the, the governor and the legislature, um, we have the strongest clean water programs in the country. And when you speak to the folks at EFC, when they go to um, national conferences, uh, the other states are saying, how are you doing this? How, wh how are you going about it? it and uh, very, very positive. Okay, they provide um, uh, financial assistance through local, I figured it out, Kevin. I think I got I got I got their presentation. But thank you. It was almost a almost a desperate. Oh, the, oh, we're gonna. Oh, well, maybe may Kevin come back here. <laughs> I'm looking. I I thought you would. See, okay, how do I get this on the screen? Yep. Just go. This is the one you want. Yeah. View. Presenter view. There you go. Okay. Pause it, and you're golden. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so we've seen that, we've seen this, we're gonna go through here, we're gonna go through here. Um, okay, so uh, I mentioned, uh, oh, so then they do, obviously EFC does uh, what they call clean water, but that's basically sanitary sewer, uh, those kinds of systems, and drinking water. And um, EFC, they're basically partnered with New York State DOC, uh, DEC and the Department of Health are, are uh, leaders on their, their board. Um, and they do a number of uh, smaller programs that some of you may have applied for, like the um, uh, Green Infrastructure Innovate Innovation Grants. Some of those have come to Westchester uh, communities. And um, there you have the numbers on uh, what they've given uh, uh, mostly with a revolving loan fund over, uh, over a longer period of time. We'll move on. Let's see. Okay, now. There we go. Um, so they, the way they work this, is, and I think you're probably aware of this, um, they have the loan portion of the project. They have uh, the, uh, depending upon your application, there are some categories if you have a certain level of need where you can get a uh, no interest loan or a low interest loan from EFC and you should, uh, you know, uh, uh, hit for the fences and see if you can qualify for that no interest. But the low interest is generally less than what you can get on the open market. Although if you're, in some years, if you're a AAA community, uh, you know, you can do pretty well on your own. And uh, uh, as it says in the second bullet, these were then matched with the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act grants, the IMG grants, and one of the things that we found after we created the program in 2015 is EFC found many communities that had never come to them for the revolving loan fund grants because they could not afford to do it even with the low interest or no interest, were now, because they get a piece of the action through the grant program, they were doing the combination of the revolving loan fund funding and, and the grants. Um, and, uh, but as they say in bullet three, you don't have to um, use EFC for the outside financing. You can um, do it via you know, your own resources. Um, New York State has an intended use plan that for the revolving loan fund, and you, you may be familiar with the process by which you submit projects to EFC's intended use plan. Um, and that is a requirement for the revolving loan fund. Uh, but if you are not in the intended use plan, your project is not in the intended use plan, and you apply for a, a WIA grant or an IMG grant, and you get awarded, they will plug you into that. It isn't, a, it isn't like you can only apply for the grants if you're already in the intended use plan, which is a good piece of flexibility um, on their part. Um, and that is um, said there in um, the third bullet. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, 4.5 billion since 2017 is the commitment th through uh, all the clean water programs of New York State. 
New York State, uh, we started uh, these programs in 2015. In 2017, because of how popular they were, there was a bigger commitment made to spend $500 million a year every year on clean water projects. Uh, the biggest share of that goes to WIA and IMG, but there are some other programs that are, are administered through DEC, the Water Quality Improvement uh, Project Program is also part of that, and there are other different programs, emergency, emerging contaminants was originally a separate program, is now part of the WIA program. Um, but again, a very robust commitment from New York State towards uh, funding these projects and um, keeping that going, and Go Governor Hochul has continued that in her budget this year. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, okay, so we have some of the numbers here. Um, uh, those are sort of the general totals. The numbers are really actually a little higher than what they have here. The total um, uh, awarded since 2015 is $1.8 billion in grants combined. Um, and we have $225 million in those two programs uh, this year. Um, and that's what you're applying for. I'm going to make a special note. You know, we're here in July. They have a short deadline, uh, I think, I, in my mind, uh, maybe a little shorter than usual. Um, so what does that mean in terms of competition for grants this year? I think that some municipalities are going to have trouble getting their grant applications together, which means um, there's a real opportunity um, if you can get an application in. You may have less competition um, in this round because of, of, of the, short, the shorter window and the fact that they, they rolled this out during the summer. Last year, it was a little later in the year, and uh, so uh, my advice would be if you have some projects in the works, something that you're working with on your engineers, make an effort to get an application in this year. I think that it is a, a ripe opportunity to take advantage of, of uh, the, the timing. Uh, who is eligible, cities, towns, villages, counties, um, uh, uh, or improvement districts, Indian nations or tribes, public authorities, public benefit corporations, school districts. Through uh, most of the program, um, it basically has been cities, towns, villages, and counties. And Westchester County uh, uh, government has done very well, as well as the, the municipalities um, in Westchester. Okay, let's see what we have here. Um, okay, the, the WIA grants, um, these are your sewage treatment plants, your stormwater systems. Um, they, uh, the state will um, pay generally 25% of your eligible costs, up to $25 million. Uh, they've played with those numbers and, and allowed you to get more money out of, out of these um, over the years. Um, and you have some of the de details there. Um, uh, grants administered through 3FC will not be used to calculate the net eligible costs um, through uh, the other programs. So uh, they're trying to score things not against you. One good thing that EFC does is if you submit an application or you submitted an application last year and you did not get an award, uh, they will not make you start from scratch. They will, allow, they will work with you, um, get on the phone with you, and tell you what you need to do, how your project was deficient, and uh, give you an opportunity to get some feedback uh, before you submit and amend your application. Also, I would say if you're if submitting a fresh application this year, I would just not submit and ask questions later. In advance of submitting, I would call up EFC staff. I would tell them what you're doing, ask for some commentary. They're going to help guide you uh, towards a successful application. Um, uh, more than any other state agency, they are very hands-on in terms of that kind of help. Um, I uh, worked on setting up a new funding program for digital inclusion programs. Digital inclusion programs for people that aren't digitally literate. It's for senior citizens or school kids or people seeking work. 
and uh, it's probably going to be administered with the state education department. But I, I sort of joked with the people in the legislature, um, I would like the Environmental Facilities Corporation to administer the digital inclusion program because they're so good at getting money out the door. So um, we will move on. Um, you get a little math here in terms of um, how they calculate the project costs based upon their formula, the 25% all makes sense. We will move on. The drinking water grants, now on these, they will pay 60% of your project costs um, up to a, a $5 million total, uh, but 60% is pretty good. And we've added the emerging, emerging contaminants um, component to this, this uh, uh, to the WIA program. Um, emerging contaminants is an issue in some Westchester communities, not as much as some of the places upstate with more of an industrial history or uh, on Long Island, but um, you should look at that if, if that is going on um, in uh, your community, you may be eligible for some of that. I'd also say that one of the things in the 2021 round that EFC did is in addition to the original amount that we had in the state budget to fund these grants, um, EFC and uh, DEC took some of the federal money and basically just supplemented the grants, backfilled and gave even greater funding than, than we had um, promised in our state budget. Um, and now you have here sort of again that uh, the drinking water component with the 60% math. Um, eligibility uh, criteria. Um, water quality improvement projects at municipally owned sewage treatment plants and works and public water systems, construction, replacement, repair of infrastructure, compliance with federal or state environmental public health laws and regulations. One of the things when we created the program, if you're being sued, um, and you may be if you're a municipality, comes with the territory, if you're being um, uh, suffering an enforcement action from a DEC, EPA, um, or uh, uh, our partner, Save the Sound, who uh, tries to put the uh, pressure on everybody to do a good job, um, that's a factor in helping you uh, score and qualify for these grants. We put in there that that should be one of the, the criteria so that we give priority to uh, communities that are under enforcement actions. Um, and then you have some uh, construction deadlines. We will get this PowerPoint to all of you um, uh, so that you have it. Um, and let's see, I'm getting an update from the head of EFC. I have an apology from Maureen Coleman, who's the executive director of EFC, saying they're sorry, they're on their way, they're coming. Um, and here we go. Um, we have evaluation criteria. Um, so here's an interesting thing, and I've had this conversation with municipalities in Westchester and with EFC. Uh, you know, what are they going to look at? They're going to look, one of the biggest criteria is um, what are you doing in terms of water quality improvement? So it's sort of funny, and uh, sometimes it, it, a project doesn't work. If you are, have a project that's preventing something, but there's nothing bad happening, you, you probably have a little, you probably lose out in competition to a community that, it, that something is already broken and, and creating um, a, a, an issue. And I've had the conversation with the EFC, want them to you know, take a, a, a second look at some of those projects, but uh, there are other programs as well. Uh, financial needs of the community, ready, readiness to advance. You know, these are uh, pro programs are designed to really get the money out the door, so you're going to have to submit uh, the engineering and do uh, some of the engineering to get to a point um, where they're going to want to uh, give you a thumbs up, um, which is uh, good, but it also puts more pressure on you. Um, level of demonstrated community uh, support. They want to know that the municipality is really behind doing the projects. If you're applying, obviously you're putting in there a submission that's saying you're ready to come up with the other funds either through a loan or um, through um, your own funds. Um, 
project examples, um, uh, construction, repair, rehabilitation, replacement of wastewater treatment, sanitary sewers, uh, uh, combined sewer overflow, uh, inflow and infiltration, all those sorts of things that we suffer here in Westchester. Um, sanitary sewer um, infrastructure to replace on-site septic systems. Some of that happens here in Westchester, not that much. Um, uh, sludge treatment and disposal, and, and um, so that's a, 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 a real question for Westchester County Environmental Facilities. Uh, would be interested in, in grants to help with that. Uh, drinking water uh, uh, projects, and we have a representative here from the Westchester Joint Water Works. Um, upgrade of drinking water infrastructure, current um, non-compliance issues, help you solve some of those. Uh, construction of uh, new infrastructure and again dealing with the emerging uh, contaminants. The IMG program, intermunicipal grants, when we started the program in 2015, um, we didn't have this. We added, I think, in 2016 or 17. Uh, you have a, an intermunicipal project. You have a water infrastructure system that covers more than one municipality. Um, if we didn't create the EMG program, in a sense, you were going to get penalized. Um, you have a bigger project, more municipalities. And so this was created for those kinds of applications. The way EFC scores these, if you're going to do something that is potentially an intermunicipal project, um, you check both boxes. They will figure out which, whether you do WIA or whether you do IMG, which boxes, uh, they will figure out which silo you're going to score better in. So they're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. You don't have to pick and choose and gamble. They will uh, just say, if you have something intermunicipal, check both boxes and, and they'll get you the, the most money they can. Um, and then again, you get uh, some of the percentage issues. Uh, 40% uh, up to $30 uh, million, um, and uh, one, um, eight, one municipality has to be the lead municipality. The first one of these that we did here in Westchester was the city of New Rochelle, the lead municipality for the town of Amaranac, Pelham, and the village of Larchmont, and they got a $5 million grant to do uh, stuff that they all uh, shared in. It was very good. Here you have some of the math again on how all that works. Uh, IMG eligibility and uh, you need to have that IMA with the other municipalities which sometimes it takes a little time to work out with the Neurochelle a lead project. They actually have been working on it for a year or so. Uh, they were about to submit and they decided they were gonna get their act together and they delayed a year before they submitted the application, but then they, they scored big in terms of um, funding. Um, criteria, again, you got the, the uh, construction window dates um, uh, and that is uh, basic same format as we saw on the other grants. And again, the evaluation criteria, they're really gonna be looking for something where you are um, creating an improvement, um, um, reducing risk, so you know, impending bad things probably do help um, based upon um, the discussion we are having earlier. Also on all these things, they certainly are trying to look at dealing with environmental uh, justice areas. Um, as part of the New York State um, Climate Action Plan process, um, there are census tracts in Westchester County um, that uh, qualify as environmental justice tr census tracts. Um, you should take a look on the um, New York State DEC Climate Action Council website and see if you have a census track that uh, may be in one of those areas uh, and you, you may have uh, an added, um, added carrot in terms of when you're applying for things. Not just these programs, other programs as well. Um, let's see, concern, uh, yeah, well, so you got some examples here of the kinds of projects. The one they did in, um, in New Rochelle and, and the, those other Sound Shore communities, they were interconnected 
uh, pipe systems that they were, were upgrading in a, in a coordinated way. Um, let's see, these are program requirements and, uh, you know, when we have EFC here normally and they go in great t detail on all these things and I always think, um, let's not spend t that much time on this, so I'm not going to spend that much time on it, but you have to do, you know, the, the seeker stuff, the smart growth MWBE and uh, other kinds of uh, labor law stuff that New York State requires for these sorts of things. Uh, program requirements, um, uh, basically they're just, uh, they want to make sure that the, the, these grant funds are used as uh, described in your application in, in your agreement. Uh, and you got some goals that uh, uh, what they're trying to do in terms of uh, some of their prioritization and distribution of these funds, but you know, your um, your projects are your projects. Uh, you know, uh, as somebody who has, uh, I used to be a mayor, applied for a lot of money. Um, you know, anytime you are applying for something, not just this, you should look and see what the criteria are and try and touch as many bases as you can, even if you didn't think that your project was uh, uh, covered some of the other things in their criteria, find a way to make sure that it does if, 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 there, if there's some, uh, some nexus. Uh, uh, okay, so bipartisan infrastructure law notice. Um, again, we're adding some of the federal funding to this and so that may come with some additional uh, requirements, that's a good question for when you're on with EFC to make sure that you do everything right in terms of the procurement procedures, uh, but it is scoring us additional money um, uh, again this year. The application process. So here's a new twist for this year. Um, they've now moved to a, an online format, and so uh, I'd be interested in you, when you apply, how that works for you, good, bad, and ugly, let me know. I speak to EFC. Um, the traditional way that they've done it actually worked out pretty well, but you, you had to send them all sorts of engineering stuff, uh, but now you're gonna do it online. Um, and again, I think with these online things, before you start inputting the stuff, have that conversation with EFC and uh, make sure that you are doing what you need to be doing um, to maximize your chances. And so now here I have a little walkthrough of what their online application looks like and um, we will share that PowerPoint with you. Let's see what they have here. Um, so you're gonna get a chart that has um, how the different programs um, all those stats about the percentages and everything all on one chart, you'll get that in the PowerPoint. Uh, so I am not gonna repeat those there. And then here is that application deadline, September 9th. And it, you know, it just, my reaction was probably much like your reaction. It's the summer, you need to get engineers involved. Uh, you know, your engineer may or may not be available for part of this time. Um, but uh, you know, this is a lot of money. This is really essential money to be able to get these projects done in a, in a, in a way where you're, you're not burdening local taxpayers with, with all of this stuff. And um, here are the names of the people on the side of the road in the Taconic State Parkway who I hope are gonna be coming here um, uh, shortly. Let's see what we have for time or updates. Um, they should be here shortly. So what I think I'm gonna do is um, answer any questions you may have for me. We're gonna then um, take a time out, give them like 10 minutes to get here. If you, I, I would recommend you hanging in and just having informal questions and answers with the folks from EFC. One of them is a finance person, one of them is an engineering person. They're gonna be able to speak your language and, and uh, the real benefit of um, your being here is to have that interaction 
with them, and um, we will all be questioning them about the um, mishap on the roadway and have their sympathies. And uh, uh, as someone who had a flat tire a couple of months ago uh, and had to get towed by AAA, not fun. Um, and I had, I had um, cooler weather than today, so I feel for fortunate. But any questions from any of you? And also, again, send regards from Senator Shelley Mayer, who um, would be here, but she is out of town this week. Uh, but she has been a real partner um, for Westchester as well on these programs, including before we created the program. She was there when we were, were pushing this, when she was a member of the Assembly, a real partner for uh, what we're doing here. So questions um, until we have a timeout. George. Yeah, just to follow up on the bond act that you started with, uh, it's probably more in your uh, wheelhouse because uh, as the assembly, you voted in favor of it for the budget. So I did some homework, and I found that in the last 10 bond acts since the beginning of the 20th century, they all passed. And they all passed by about 10% margin. Uh, some more. This one, however, runs in the headwind of all that pandemic relief funding that has been uh, pushed through the economy, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that is now law and uh, is also going to carry more debt. Is there a sense that the voters may be tired of debt, debt fatigue, and this has less of a chance of uh, uh, being approved, and if so, should we be, we be doing an education vote yes campaign for it? Well, there is a vote yes campaign getting going, and, and so we should talk a, about that. It's an interesting question. I mean, um, I was reading Paul Krugman's column the other day about inflation, and, and um, had I known you were going to ask that question, I would have tried to get Paul Krugman to be here as part of our panel. But. Um, but uh, you know, I, I would say this, that uh, this Bond Act has been proposed, was originally supposed to be in uh, 2020, and because of the pandemic, we postponed it. Um, the funding items in here are so essential, and I, I think that the, the first thing I would lead off on is, if I'm a municipality, and I know what is on the project list, uh, I, have, I get scared thinking of what it looks like if the Bond Act does not pass and how we're going to pay for a lot of things that we really need to do. Um, so a lot of the stuff is related to storm resilience. And, and so, you know, I was on this stormwater grant program thing before, uh, for a few years. But in Ida, what did we learn? In many of the communities in Westchester County, Ida revealed that not all of the flooding was near a stream or near uh, a coast. A lot of the flooding was that the municipal stormwater system is either uh, uh, in disrepair and failed or is not of adequate capacity. And so this is going to be major money to help municipalities do something that is keeping somebody that's nowhere near water suddenly has flooding in their, in their homes. Uh, so there, there's a lot of clean energy stuff, electrification stuff, some of the, uh, we mentioned the electric school buses, but the other stuff there. Uh, with all the things going on uh, in the climate change world right now, um, the Great Salt Lake is drying up. It's 115 in, in England. Uh, uh, it was way too hot the last week in Westchester. We, uh, and I was saying to somebody earlier, I, I, we have to do something about climate change, but on a personal level, um, I'm a winter person. I'm unhappy if it's over 65 degrees. We need to step up our game in, in, at, a, at a lot of levels. So it's a good question, but there's gonna be a, a, a campaign going, and George will talk, because I know some of the people, it hasn't really started yet, but some of the same groups that you've been working with for 20 years are starting to organize, and CIC, I'm sure, will be part of that as, as you have in the, in the past. And so, it's also a good job creator. A lot of jobs will be created from the Bond Act. Actually, they've es estimated um, over 100,000 new jobs for the Bond Act. I think if I look at the metrics for what the WIA program has created in jobs, I think that they, they have underestimated the job creation from the Bond Act. So, other questions? Have the, the costs of not doing these things 
been thought about as part data that could be part of this campaign? That's a good question uh, for which I don't have numbers right here, but your premise is undoubtedly true because uh, just, just again look at Ida and you ask any municipality around here what their uh, infrastructure costs were because they weren't able to sustain Ida um, successfully uh, huge. In 2007, when we had uh, storms, uh, we had uh, two storms in 2007, um, I was mayor of the city of Rye then. Our estimated cost of the damage of those storms for just little city of Rye was $80 million. So there is no doubt that resilience is a, a key part of um, cost saving um, uh, for the taxpayers, but it's also saving lives. It's also uh, you know public health, uh, just a, a lot of a, a lot of mishap. There are people that were displaced in Ida that are not back in their homes. I think politically, you could make the case to uh, for the public to also understand risk preparedness. Yep. These are predictable risks. Yep, I think that's great, and I will pass that on. One of the uh, folks that's involved um, was not able to come today, but. The New York League of Conservation Voters is working on uh, pulling together a coalition um, for, for uh, recommending that people vote yes on the bond issue. So I will pass that, um, that messaging on to them. I think it's a great point. In the back there. Steve, can I actually just dovetail off that? There actually is an ongoing vote yes campaign group. The groups that you mentioned say it's now we're part of that as yep. well. There's a website, unfortunately, it's not coming up on the other bookmark, but it's the I'll get that to you, George, but the idea right now is there's a lot of coalition building going on and that there's that public awareness campaign that's going to start really in Labor Day and, and, and right around there and push forward to November. So that, that is underway and moving forward. And so a lot of the, thank you for that. The website, uh, which um, is up, but it really is just beginning, the website has a list of dozens of environmental groups and other groups that are um, in support of the Bond Act. The website doesn't yet really have all the details of what's in the Bond Act, so why I didn't throw the website up here is, I think the website needs some... It's still early. It's yeah, yeah, early yeah, it's... Stage, but by Labor Day, another month from now, it'll be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the back there, Stuart. Yeah, Steve, first of all, thanks for holding this today. I think it's been great, so thank you. Um, my one question is, and I apologize if I missed this from the beginning of the presentation, but as far as the Bond Act, is there already uh, a percentage of match that's already been worked into it that municipalities are expected to meet or a threshold in order to receive a certain amount of money? So it's a good question. So the Bond Act has a lot of different moving parts in it. Some of them are to fund uh, existing programs like we and IMG, uh, like an additional infusion of money towards existing programs. And so we sort of know what those um, percentages look like. For many of the parts of the Bond Act, they're going to be new programs, and so a lot of those details have not been figured out yet, and I, I think that people will look at, at different metrics and see what works. I will tell you with WE and IMG, um, the percentages and the max out amounts have been adjusted uh, each year. EFC looks at, at, at some of the experience and what they're hearing from municipalities and makes intelligent adjustments to, to make the money go farther and work there. So we'll be tracking that, but there will be dozens of new programs to deal, especially in the resiliency area, and they, they have not figured all those things out yet. Can I just, just follow up on sure. that? Just, if you want to make a note, I mean, I'm, I only speak for my own municipalities experience, but when you have municipalities that rely heavily on borrowing, especially for these types of projects, there are a number of grants out there that we take advantage of that somehow expect us to have either a certain amount of funding or they want to reimburse us once the project is complete, which means that if we don't have enough cash on hand, we're bonding or issuing debt for projects and then that is somehow falling into repaying debt service and goes into our operating budgets and so forth. So just to keep that in mind, you know, municipalities may look for opportunities where if the money is injected or as a partner with the state in completing projects, it will lower our responsibility to borrow by being able to use funding that's cash on hand. 
Uh, there are many experienced hands in the room who have dealt with this, and, and I, I'd share, you know, most state grant programs are on a reimbursement basis. Uh, there are some programs where they'll give you some money when they know it's about to happen or something, but that's a, a good thing. I will mention that to my colleagues um, and Ways and Means staff in, in Albany and, and, and speak to, uh, you know, the, the heads of the different state agencies. I think that's a, a, great, a great issue. So, other questions? Yes. Hi, Steve. Kevin Wayne, Town of Bedford. Again, thanks for having this. So we were fortunate to be the recipient of a WIA grant for uh, emerging contaminants, PFAS, and we're working with the state health department, uh, who's the kind of engineering arm of EFC on that. But we've yet to receive our contract. Uh, there was a gentleman named Dwight Brown at EFC that was extremely responsive, but he's not on WIA anymore. And I imagine with the additional or significant increase of funds, kind of EFC is administratively challenged, but is that a problem you're aware of currently, just kind of things being a little slower because of all the work going on? No, I, you know, they're pretty good about getting money out the door and, and, and actually during COVID, interestingly enough, where they were, all state agencies were remote. Um, when I would talk to the head of EFC, what I was hearing was they were actually moving things, uh, you know, sometimes even quicker because uh, people were like not distracted by other things in the office. They're sort of knocking this stuff out. They're pretty good, but um, when our folks from EFC come, you know, I, I, hope, I hope they're not coming via actually being towed here. But uh, when they come, you should ask that very specific question and, and they will, they will um, you know, get, f find the people involved and get back to you and see what the status is. And, and certainly from my office or from any, if you're not in the areas I rep represent, uh, you can call your senator or your assembly person, um, uh, or, or you can call me. I, I troubleshoot for anybody in Westchester, whether they're in, in the communities I represent or not. But um, happy to help, uh, but we, we can get you an answer on that and hopefully they'll be here soon. And uh, kudos to your former supervisor, Chris Burdick, who's a, a good colleague of mine in um, the assembly, former town supervisor of Bedford. And um, he's actually um, in the city today at an event. Otherwise, he, he uh, um, would have been here uh, him, him, himself. But he um, is a big supporter of these programs and uh, used them as a, a supervisor and pushes for them in, in uh, the assembly. So. Absolutely, yeah. He's been a great advocate of Bedford and you know, the county. Yeah, I was just going to say, in the case of the Westchester Joint Water Works, we received an IMG grant, and I think the contract, the uh, finalization of the contract was deferred about three months from the objective date. Yeah, and they give a reason? Uh, I, th I think that was volume. Uh, that was volume. You know, there's also the piece which is before they can actually cut the check, there's the, uh, some additional paperwork with the Attorney General's office and the State Controller's office, and so that can build in some time. But um, they're, they're very much at EFC, more than any agency I've seen on a mission of really trying to get those checks cut and, and to close contracts. They, when, you, when you get the award, they want to move as quickly as possible to do the contract with you. That's not, you don't always get that kind of urgency from from other agencies. So my experience is, as, as I say, I'd, I'd let them um, administer my my personal finances. Yeah. They're so no, good they, at they it. Were very responsive yeah. Process, yeah. So. Yeah. Other comments and questions. Well, I'm going to thank you all for coming. I would say, if you can, hang on. They. What, let's see if I have an update from these folks. Um. um now, the, the, the worst case scenario was they said they would be here by 12.15. This was after earlier projections that they were going to be here by 11.45. Did someone just pull up? Uh, there. <laughs> so, um, and, and, um, you know, I probably, I, for where I was brief in the presentation, it was probably stuff you know anyway, so uh, there you have it. But, is any uh, PCR to benefit loss ratio, is that a requirement for these programs? Uh, not in the same way they do it with FEMA. I think that they're more looking towards um, um, uh, uh, water quality improvement okay. is the biggest 
a, a biggest factor. So let, let me um, hold up for one second. So we're going to start up again. And uh, I'm going to introduce our, our weary travelers. We have Caitlin Penner, who's the deputy director of EFC's engineering division. She is a professional engineer. Um, and uh, uh, we have some engineers in the audience. Um, and we have um, Aaron Gagne, who is EFC's um, uh, a financial anal analyst in EFC's finance division. And so they're here to answer your questions, but I first want to answer the question um, in terms of um, fault for the flat tire. Do you think we're looking at a, a OGS didn't keep their tires correctly uh, in shape or uh, the throughway authority didn't fix a pothole quickly enough? We're not placing any blame on anything. <laughs> So what I'm going to ask, one of the two of you come up here and take the microphone and just take questions from folks up here. And, 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 and uh, thank you so much for persevering and not turning back. You know, and, 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 uh, Introduce which yes. one of you. I'm Caitlin. Place. Hi, nice to meet everyone. I actually recognize some faces. I worked on the Westchester project for 14 years before I became the deputy director. So lots of uh, work down in this area. I believe you were the mayor of Rye when yep. I uh, yep. started working on yep. the Westchester project. So. Well, thank thank yes. you for all the help. I'm a big fan of EFC. And so, uh, you know, we have two really dedicated professionals here to answer your questions that are specific to your community. So. The floor is yours, and why don't we just, um, do you want to start with your question? Sure, yeah. thank you. Go Hi, my name is Kevin Wynn. I work for the Town of Bedford, and we're really grateful to be the recipient of a WEA uh, program for PFAS mitigation. Uh, I, Dwight Brown is the gentleman I've been dealing with a lot through the process, extremely responsive, but I guess he's no longer involved with WEA, and I'm trying to work towards getting uh, contract documents and kind of finalized things, so I didn't uh, know the exact time frame for that. We get the award letter in May, I believe. So um, if you can get your documents in, we are working on uh, reviewing those applications from the last round that was awarded, and we should be getting out missing items letters shortly to identify any additional items that were missing for those projects. Okay, but should we have received contracts at this point or no? Con so, yeah, go ahead. Um, so <laughs> the initial award, um, that's the award offer letter, but there is, you know, a lot of back and forth that needs to happen between EFC and the municipalities before there's actually a, a grant agreement. So um, the missing items letters that um, Caitlin referenced, those will be coming out. They typically come from the finance division, so the financial analysts will be reaching out with those letters and it lists, you know, everything that we need in order to close on this grant agreement. So once we um, will work with the municipality to get those items in, you know, work on any questions you have, and then once you know, we kind of have our package ready to go, we have a two to three month approval process that we bring you know this full package with all the supporting documents um, through to get the proper approvals, and then once it kind of makes its way through that, we set a final closing date. The grant agreement is closed upon, and then from there we work with the municipality to start releasing the funds. So um, basically, we'll be in contact and we'll kind of help guide you through that whole process. The first step will be that missing items letter that you'll receive. That'll kind of be the starting point. And then from there, we kind of go back and forth to get that all secured. Okay. We're, we're moving forward with design because there's an existing violation for PFAS. So I'm trying to figure out how to make sure that my, the costs we're incurring now for design and test wells and things like that are, are going to be eligible. Have you been working with uh, Brock Rogers at DOH? He yeah. should be able to provide you any information you would need for um, your design contract or anything that's needed to be included in there. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? The question I asked was for the, the DCR, the benefit cost ratio, how much does that factor in? or is that the part of the application? How much is that factored in in the awarding or consideration of the grants? A lot of the people ones all require that, but Yeah, our program does not require a benefit cost ratio. Um, 
we do so as long as you're eligible for you know a, a municipality or district that's eligible for the WIA funds um, we evaluate you and it's based primarily on score and uh, public support and the, the things that were identified on one side I can go back to it if you need me to Great. but yeah. what's really wonderful is when you ask a question and I gave an answer and I gave you the right answer there you so go. Yeah. That's true. That's good. That's true. <laughs> so why don't we move to just like mingling around and, yes. and we will close this out we have these two weary travelers that were, were stuck on the nearest state freeway um, but come and ask have individual conversations about your applications while they're here with us and, and uh, thank you all for coming to our workshop and and anything I can do to help you um, get an application in, give me a call, uh, and we're there to help. And uh, want to see this money coming to Westchester as much as possible. So, thank you.